Well, thank you to Marco and Gemma for the invitation. It's a, a real thrill, especially this time of year. It's dark, 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 and very cold in Scotland. So any chance to be in the California, Southern California sunshine is very welcome. So I appreciate this especially broad umbrella of logic to, <laughs> to include a talk on eclipse expeditions. So uh, as Marco said, I'm going to talk about 19th century eclipse expeditions. What I'm going to do today is give you a kind of a, a big overview of the sets of questions that were being addressed and answered uh, related to eclipse expeditions across the course of the 19th century and how this connects to development of technology and history of chemistry, uh, questions of empire, and uh, kind of national scientific interests. So I would be remiss uh, if I did not mention that there is an eclipse coming up across North America, April the 8th. 2024, if you can, when it's not very close to California, but if you can possibly get yourself uh, to the zone of totality, it is a, an experience to have. If that's not something that you've done, it is a kind of a, well, it's a, a transcendent experience. It's, it's remarkable. Now, the method that is used to calculate this, so this is a, a map uh, made by Michael Zeiler, who's the, one of the top two uh, eclipse path calculators currently at work. And the method that's used here is essentially the same as the method developed in 1824 by Frederick Bessel. And this innovation in eclipse prediction overhauled the methods that had been previously used. So there's lots of records of eclipse prediction and the Antikythera mechanism. You know, they're sort of uh, understanding of that as an eclipse predictor. But what Bessel did was to sort of reorient the, the frame of reference from standing on the globe and tracking planetary motion in the sky to something that looks like this, right? Considering a plane through the globe, normal to the, the light coming from the sun, and then you locate the shadow on the plane and project it back up onto the surface of the earth. So this is the essentially some spherical trigonometry, the details of which are sticky and not very interesting. But this is sort of what's going on. and what this did was allow the the um, prediction of eclipses well in advance, and not just when they were going to happen, but the kind of crucial point here is where you have to be on the surface of the globe to be in the zone of eclipse totality. So this happens in 1824. Now, it's kind of an interesting kind of astronomical development, but it doesn't have any kind of major, major impact until the question of sort of there are scientific reasons to want to be in the zone of totality. And this, the story here is a kind of an interesting one, which has to do with the observation of the planet Neptune in 1846. So this, as I imagine is known to many in this audience, is a massive triumph for Newton's theory of gravitation. So Newton develops his gravitational theory and 1781, the planet Uranus is observed by John Herschel and Caroline Herschel. And there are predictions made for the orbit of Uranus according to the going methods of the time. And the observations start to deviate from the calcu calculated orbit. And this deviation just increases over a period of 30, 40 years, and it's getting pretty grim. And so people are speculating about what else might be going on. And so there are predictions about what other celestial body might be out there disrupting Uranus off its calculated orbit. And so the it's a it's a big kind of famous priority debate between uh, Leverrier and Adams, and you can sort of read that story another time. But what happens, of course, is that the planet Neptune is observed in 1846. And this is triumph, right? Not only is it a new planet, but it is the predictive power of mathematics. So this is the first time that a planet has been discovered, something major has been discovered uh, using tools of celestial mechanics and Newtonian gravitation. And so if you've got uh, a system that's working, maybe it'll work twice. So this is a, a beautiful image, um, spectral image of the planet Mercury. Now, the motion of Mercury had been a topic of investigation, particularly by Leverrier, who was uh, did some work on Neptune. And the orbit of Mercury has observed to kind of wobble. So this is the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. And there was a lot of wondering about what was happening there. Well, work for Neptune, maybe we can discover another planet. Maybe this will work again. And so there were predictions and calculations and 
you know, studying of the Neptune predictions and trying to figure out what the, what the story would be. But if you want to check, if you want to look up in the sky near Mercury, it's tricky because the sun is very bright. So if you can wait until there's an eclipse, it gives you just a couple minutes to take a look in the sky, right, around the region of the sun to see if you can find an intermercurial planet. So this becomes suddenly a point of interest. So there's huge glory to be had for discovering a new planet. Uh, it was, a again, a generated enormous uh, controversy and public interest and scientific administrative intrigue and uh, spin, all kinds of all kinds of interesting stuff going on with the, the Neptune story. But it raises the possibility that this could be duplicated. And so eclipse observers who now know right, well in advance where they need to be when would like to see if during eclipse totality they can find an intermercurial planet. So that, that happens in 1846 is Neptune. And then also during this time in the 1840s, the science of photography is developing. And again, that's a kind of long and fascinating story that has to do with toxic chemicals and glass plates and mechanical uh, mechanical shutters and speeds and all, all kinds of things. But the so the first photograph of the moon is taken in the early 1840s. And the first photograph of the solar corona, of which you can see a grainy image here, is uh, taken in 1851 by Johann Burkowski. Uh, and you can imagine with the sort of the contrast and the distance that photographing something like a total eclipse is particularly challenging. And so this opens up a whole new world of possibility. Can we use a camera for astronomical research? Is this a reliable instrument? Is it better than your eye? Is it worse than your eye? Is your eye more reliable? Is a sketch better, right? There's a, a kind of a set of questions that circulate around uh, this photograph and uh, others others like it. So this enters into the lineup. Oh, yeah. So this enters into the lineup. Uh, some other tasks, right, for eclipse observers. We're looking for an intermercurial planet. That should say planet, not plane. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to observe the corona, but more than observe the solar corona, we want to photograph it. And we want to photograph other eclipse phenomena that are, you know, sort of starting to be observed. Things like Bailey's beads and um, the prominence, those rosy prominences on the side of, of the solar corona. Now, the 1851 um, eclipse there generated this first photograph of the solar corona. Uh, it also generated something that does not, uh, you can't put on a slide very well, which is the precision of lunar tables. So in 1851, the, the US had recently uh, started its own naval observatory, uh, uh, sorry, nautical almanac office, because they wanted to compute, they wanted to do all of their navigation for uh, trade and commerce and military using only American sources. So this was a, a project in 1849, the Navy uh, started producing the, the nautical almanac. Now, the U.S. is in its own well, sort of a one-sided competition because the UK doesn't really care. But uh, in particular, the US wants to be independent from British science. This is a, a big part of the, fundamental. what's that? Fundamental. Uh, fundamental, yes, <laughs> fundamentally. Um, and there's a group of uh, American scientists in, in, uh, on the East Coast primarily who are very self-conscious about this, that they really want to kind of do American science the American way. Uh, and one of the things that that means in their interpretation is that we aren't going to rely on British lunar tables because that is surely the sign of international dependence. So we're not, we're not going to rely on British lunar tables. So you can check your lunar tables if you have your calculated time of the first contact, right? The moon is supposed to go across the face of the sun. And then you can see how long it takes and check whether your tables are accurate or not. And in 1851, uh, the U.S. Uh, lunar tables turn out to be dramatically more accurate uh, than the British ones. So this is a huge triumph, again, one-sided triumph, because the, the British, they, they kind of don't, they seem totally unflapped by any of this. Uh, but it is a big deal to the American Nautical Almanac, and it also generates funding, because they've gotten government funding, there's congressional appropriations for this Nautical Almanac office, and this fact uh, observed during a partial eclipse in uh, just outside of DC in 1851, 
um, showed that this was in fact successful. And therefore the government is gonna spend more money. All right, so this is uh, on the list and I show you the dates here. So the ones that are highlighted in green, these are all um, total solar eclipses in the 19th century after 1851. So after that first photograph of the solar corona, which does what graphics often do is generate more interest. And if you can show people a picture of the corona or you can report that there exists a picture of the corona, uh, that sort of stimulates more interest than just some you know, equations of motion, for example. So the, the ones in green here are ones that are uh, more accessible, right there on uh, land places where you can get. And the, what I wanna draw your attention to are these four over here on the right-hand side. So 1868, 69, 70, 71. So that's four in a row, uh, which is great because eclipses, again, they're very short. You're dealing with a lot of kind of temperamental equipment. You've got cameras and um, telescopes of various kinds and timing uh, instruments, again, many kinds of uh, timekeeping time keeping instruments. Uh, you've got to develop your photographs in a purpose-built dark room right, full of, again, toxic chemicals and glass bottles that you have to schlep to wherever the zone of totality happens to be. Uh, and so practice is really valuable. Now, I mentioned at the beginning also that the experience of eclipse totality can be a bit overwhelming. And this is true for 19th century sciences as much as it is true for people who might observe the eclipse in, uh, in this coming April. And so there is a the kind of an effort to send people who've already been because sometimes on the first eclipse outing there are reports of people who say i was so overcome i couldn't do my science so if you want to get results right it's best to send people with experience so so you've got a nice run here where you can build up some experience and eclipse observation and all the kind of techniques technical uh, proficiencies that you need and more importantly maybe for this to record i forget any time to record sorry mm. could you turn on the powerpoint onto the zoom is the host is unable to receive a request to record the host is an incompatible client or device please ask them to give recording permission I cannot record. All right. Sorry, it is not it, it does not charge. I don't understand why it does not charge. I'm using left peers. No. I am not seeing the PowerPoint. Oh, somebody's talking. I'm not it's seeing the PowerPoint on Zoom. I'm seeing Oh, the, they're not seeing the slides. The, I'm seeing the, the announcement for the uh lecture. Hmm. What's the problem? They're not seeing the slides. They're sharing his pause. Uh, oh, whoops. I don't want to do that. Spoiler. Um, no, no, I see to report it from the beginning. There's slides. You see it is so if I now the recording is recording. yes the recording now I share that's okay now you see the slides do you see the slides I see a red uh, sphere. Looks like a sun in Corona. <laughs> there you go. That is light. It is a light. That's um, a Deborah did not come here with the sun. No. She just... brought sun, but she did not come not with the sun. The whole sun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, almost. Yeah. Okay, so here, 68, 69, 70, 71, uh, there's a nice run of eclipses. And also, more even sort of more significantly than let's photograph the corona, let's look for an intramercurial planet, let's test our lunar tables. 
there is a huge run up to 1874 because in 1874 is going to happen the transit of Venus. And the transit of Venus is a much more rare, predictable uh, astronomical phenomenon than even a total solar eclipse. They happen twice, eight years apart, every 125 years. If I have any celestial mechanics folks in here, yes, that's not exact. There's like little adjustments in there, but that's sort of the, the frequency at which they're occurring. Mm -hmm. So 1874, and the plan by national governments and scientific interests sort of around the world that is massive enterprise to send at vast expense scientists to all sides of the globe because they want to answer the basic fundamental question about the size of the astronomical unit. And they're going to use parallax to do this, right? This is the plan. And so in order to do that for the transit of Venus, so this is a, an image, beautiful image from the 2012 transit of Venus. That was the last one, sorry to say, <laughs> for the next 100 years. Uh, but this, this, there's Venus right there, and it's transiting across the face of the sun. And so in order to get the data you need to solve the parallax problem, you have to time it, right? How long does it take? And so if you want to time, how long does it take for the planet Venus to transit the sun? Well, if you want to practice doing that, that's very similar to timing a total solar eclipse. So they're looking at all of these solar eclipses, particularly those in the 1870s, where the technology is probably about where it's gonna be in 1874, kind of plus or minus. And they are kind of gearing up for this huge open question about, let's figure out how big is the universe. Okay, so this is, this is on their list. They wanna time eclipse phases so that they can know how to do it in uh, 1874. Now, spoiler, this method does not work <laughs> because of something called the black drop problem. And this was not conclusively proven until 2012. But that, that was the plan. They wanted to do this. Uh, it was kind of a cataclysmic disaster. And a lot of governments who had planned to have a pair of transit of Venus expeditions, they kind of canceled the second one. Uh, the, the US carried on with the second one and got a good measurement for the, the speed of light and with some kind of minor successes, but it was kind of globally speaking a massive letdown, uh, the transit of Venus after an enormous amount of buildup. And again, very the vast expense. What's that? The name of the it's called the black drop problem. And it means like, I don't know what you can see. so there's the sun. And so here's Venus. And as Venus is kind of coming in, right? It's kind of coming around. When it gets close, atmospheric conditions and um, visual right. like light bending and so on, um, it looks like this. <laughs> and you can't actually get a precise time on when right. the edge of Venus touches, touches the edge of the sun. Yeah, there's, I can send you a nice picture about it if you want to see, but that's, the, that's what happens. Um, and they didn't, <laughs> they didn't know that in 1874. And, it was um, kind of conclusively determined in, in 2012 that that's like, you can't actually precisely measure that. All right, so this is uh, this is on the list. Now, um, so in 1860, uh, there's an eclipse that's set to go, you can see across um, the, wait a second, my image is, Oh, I just can't see it on the screen. Yeah. Anyway, there's the, the path of eclipse, uh, eclipse totality in 1860. I use this image here just to show you the kinds of things that were being published in popular outlets. Newspaper coverage is extensive in all kinds of periodicals, scientific and otherwise. There are reports about uh, the forthcoming eclipse. If you pay attention to the, the news coverage on the April eclipse, which will probably start you know, picking up kind of around February, uh, you just sort of translate that to a 19th century version. It's basically identical to what to what you see in, in 19th century publications. It is quite remarkable as the, the consistency of the sort of human response to this, uh, this phenomenon. All right, now in 1860, it's going across the sort of Northern part of North America there. And the US, it's sort of fresh off its triumph in his single-sided triumph in 1851 of having precise lunar tables. 
And so they think, all right, great. We are on home, like home corn advantage, right? This eclipse path is going across North America. Uh, and in 1860, this is what uh, North America sort of looks like. So California over there, already a state. Um, right, these orange windowed states, the green ones are territories. And just a word about that part in the middle there. It's not this vast expanse of nothingness. There is an incredible conflict and decimation happening uh, to indigenous populations in, in the middle there uh, over this period, um, over this period of time. So the U.S. has three uh, expeditions that take off in 1860. Uh, this map here is drawn by Simon Newcomb, who was a young computer at that new nautical almanac office. And the, <laughs> these are sort of three amazing stories I will just tell you uh, sort of in brief. So over there is just uh, outside of Washington, well, they should be on the map. Sorry, there's something got off with the, they should be on the map. They should be just on just on land there uh, in Washington state. And this is James Gillis who left from New York on a steamer with a kind of hodgepodge of borrowed scientific equipment. Now, notably, he's going to the Pacific Northwest. Now, what is true about the Pacific Northwest? It is frequently cloudy. And so if you had a scientific observer going to the Pacific Northwest to see an eclipse, you might decide he didn't really need a camera. And so he didn't, they didn't give him a camera. He didn't get a camera. He took five weeks, took a steamship all the way around, met up with his son in San Francisco, traveled an additional two weeks north, uh, gets to the, the camp, they set up, uh, they clear skies, beautiful corona, uh, no camera, <laughs> and he, he doesn't make any records. So he's one of these ones who says he was totally overcome by the spectacle and did not record any measurements whatsoever. So James Gill had a great day out uh, with his son, but <laughs> not not much for uh, for the cause of American science. Now in the middle there, this is uh, central Saskatchewan. Uh, it's along the river. It's really uh, was quite, well, still is, and was at the time certainly quite remote. So that's where Simon Newcomb went. It took 46 days, uh, every horrific, uh, travel misadventure you can imagine. Uh, the train broke down. The stagecoach broke a wheel in the mud. They got eaten by mosquitoes. Their canoe got a hole in it. Uh, they had their tents broke. They had to eat pemmican. The whole thing was just a like a real trudge. And so he had four colleagues from the East Coast, uh, a natural scientist, uh, another um, computer from the Nautical Almanac office, and uh, just a friend they brought along for moral support. And they also had help with uh, Métis guides who uh, rode the canoes and uh, sort of, I think, were the uh, the kind of labor behind uh, behind this enterprise. So they they go on this epic journey. It's all kind of dreadful. And they get there. And the morning of the eclipse, it is cloudy. Uh, they don't see anything. They're sad about this. They collect a bunch of natural history specimens, which they take back, which are now in the collection at Harvard. They didn't want it to be a kind of a total loss. So way north up there, it's around Elizabeth Island. Again, it's kind of a ragtag bunch of people who sort of volunteered. There's no sort of centrally organized U.S. eclipse expedition at this point. And they take a coast survey steamer north. They almost run out of gas. They know we hit an iceberg. They, <laughs> it snows. They get off course. They get sort of lost. It's a whole, a whole thing. They finally get there. They can't get off the ship because of where they wanted to get off the ship because of the conditions. So they land somewhere else, they hike inland, um, they set up all their equipment and it is cloudy. So there's one guy who's on the ship who does see the Corona. He has like a clear patch of sky, but he was just left behind because he was you know, kind of the lowly whoever he was and wasn't left with any equipment or instructions. So he again, lovely afternoon, he saw the Corona. No records for American science. Now, so these are things that happen to eclipse observers. So again, should you find yourself in totality, the zone of totality and not see anything, no, you are in great company. But this is particularly distressing because also in 1860, Warren Delarue, who is a very established British scientist at the time, has this 
which is the Q photoheliograph, which is about eight feet tall and it weighs about 400 kilograms. This is a massive instrument purpose built for photographing the sun. So the British military puts this on a boat. They take it over to Spain where there's a newly built railroad. And so the Admiralty kind of loads this thing on the ship. He has all the papers to get through customs. Nobody opens any of his lenses. Everything is great. And he goes to the zone of totality. He makes a, what is at the time a kind of risky decision to use wet collodion uh, photography instead of a daguerreotype. Uh, you get finer precision, but it is much riskier. Uh, but he has tremendous success and he captures this image of the solar corona which has, you can sort of see it up on the corners there. You can see the, the rosy prominences, these kind of red glowing pieces in pretty fine detail. You'll see certainly much finer detail than in that 1851 photograph. And this makes huge news. It's all over the newspapers around the world. The New York Times uh, talks about the glowing rosy prominences. Uh, and there's a kind of a little footnote about how, oh, there were all sorts of Americans who tried to See something but nothing you know so this is a real story of british scientific triumph this photograph of warren delarue um, in 1869 uh, sorry in 1860 uh i should also mention warren delarue is the one who gets all the credit there are teams of people right you've got people in the developers you've got people keeping time you've got people it's not even clear if he's the one who clicked the the, sh the shutter button on the camera but that's the, he gets the credit um, for the photograph. Now, this, given, given the kind of competitive nature of things, you can imagine it's hugely disappointing to the American scientists at this point. Whoops. And in particular, it is hugely disappointing to this guy, who is Benjamin Peirce. So he had, uh, he, he was working at Harvard at the time, they located that nautical almanac office in proximity of him. He was kind of the preeminent American mathematician, father of Charles, I'll mention for philosophers. And um, he had for a long time been a very vocal proponent of this idea that Americans need to be doing American mathematics the American way. And we need to uh, detach ourselves from, from Great Britain. And so, in 1867, he becomes the superintendent of the U.S. Coast Survey. So this puts him in charge of a huge budget, about a $500,000 budget, and teams of surveyors all across, the, particularly the coast of the U.S., but also across the center. Uh, they produce thousands of pages of reports, and the idea is that they are mapping the coastline. So he's in charge of this operation. It's a very powerful scientific administrative position. And this is in 1867. Now, in 1867, they are gearing up. Whoops, there we go. They're gearing up for an 1869 eclipse. Now, this one, you can see the features here. This is also major American home court advantage. This is going all the way across uh, North America, much like the one coming up, but just the kind of op opposite orientation. Now, at this time, there are a couple things that are going on. So this is a map of US railroads and telegraphs. And you can see that a lot of those railroads and telegraphs get you to the zone of totality. Now, we already saw in 1860 with Warren Delarue the advantage of having a train to get all of your equipment to the place that you're going. Uh, telegraphs you use to determine your longitude. So you can actually figure out that you are, oops, sorry, that you, actually on the earth are actually in the place that corresponds to the zone of totality on the map. So again, there's some sort of non-trivial calculations that are going on there. And you will notice that up here, oops, in the top left, the path of eclipse totality is coming onto North America in Alaska, which has recently been transferred to the U.S. 1867, the U.S. acquires Alaska from Russia while Peirce is the superintendent of the Coast Survey. So what does he do? He immediately sends a whole team of people, George Davidson was in charge of them, to Alaska to map the coastline. So they're also looking obviously for um, minerals to extract and valuable objects to exploit in Alaska. This is also part of the, uh, part of the enterprise. Now the, the land 
up there. So this is uh, the coast. This is what it looks like. Um, there's sort of mountains and it's very snowy and there's sort of inlets and intercoastal waters and so on. And so George Davidson, who's been tasked by Peirce two years ahead of the eclipse, right? So this is a long range plan. So 1867, they're planning ahead for 1869. So this is what George Davidson encounters and he gets some incredible help from Chief Ko Klux, uh, who is the in charge of the Kwanlin Dun nation. And he and his wives produced this map of intercoastal trade routes used by generations of the Kwanlin Dun. And this is a, a very special map that it lives in uh, special collections at Berkeley. And it was recently sort of returned to the Kwanlin Dun um, on its 150th uh, anniversary in uh, 2019. So this is the map uh, that Davidson and Peirce are going to use to um, to plan for eclipse observation success. Right? You've got an entire ribbon across the country. We definitely do not want to get shut out by clouds like we were in 1860. And how do you optimize your chances? You put people in a lot of places because probably it's not going to be cloudy everywhere. You can hope so. All right, so this is happening in 1867. It's all happening in 1867 in preparation for 1869. But meanwhile, there is an eclipse. This is the 1868 eclipse, the first of those four that I mentioned. So this is across the southern third of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and the there aren't any Americans that I'm aware of that went to this eclipse, but there are British observers there with, obviously there's a big British military presence. Uh, there are French observers that are there. There's German observers who are there. Uh, and out of, out of this, there is a new instrument that has just been developed. And the new instrument that's just been developed is somebody took one along and thought, let's try it on the solar corona. And so they do. So this is a spectroscope. Let me move the this so you can see the spectroscope. Oops, maybe not. There we go. All right, so that's the spectroscope uh, used by John Herschel. So it's currently at the Royal Society in London. And this is the uh, spectrum that he generated. You can see right here near the sodium D line, the yellow sodium D line there, that's helium. And so helium is observed in the solar corona. This is not isolated on earth until 1895. And so again, this is big news, right? We went to a total solar eclipse. We took this new instrument and lo and behold, we discovered something that no one's ever discovered. Right? We did not discover our intermercurial, intermercurial planet, which they are always mentioning in their reports. Oh, we didn't find the we didn't find the planet, but we did find a new element. Yay us! All right. So this happens, and so this adds. Oops. This adds to the lineup. There should be. I'm not sure what's happening. It's not. There we go. So there's the new item on the list, right? We're going to have spectral analysis of the chromosphere and the prominence. What is the sun made of? That's the question. And there are questions about whether or not the corona is actually part of the sun. Is the corona part of the moon? Is the corona made up of different stuff from the sun? There are all these kinds of chemical composition questions about uh, the about the sun. And so as the Americans are kind of gearing up for the 1869 eclipse, they are being aware of what's going on and they're thinking, okay, we've got to <laughs> we've got to figure this out. We've got to at least do one of these things. Right? This is the this is the hope for the 1869 eclipse. Now, to at least do one of these things, they are going to send people to as many places as they possibly can. Now, again, this is not really centrally organized. So Peirce is the head of the Coast Survey, and there are certainly uh, Coast Survey, uh, oh, well, surveyors for the Coast Survey who are in these various places who get sent, but there are many volunteers who go. There's a private photography club in Philadelphia that purpose built a practice, a practice dark room. The railroad company made them free of charge, a custom Pullman car so they could take all their photography gear uh, to the, the central park of the zone of totality. 
Now, I always feel very bad for these people in St. Louis. So they're they're kind of the mostly in the zone part. They didn't see any. And the same thing with people in um, Franklin up there. So the reason for spreading out all the people is to, number one, minimize your chances of being shut out. And number two, to actually test your eclipse prediction. So getting where are the limits of that zone, exactly where those lines are. Again, this has to do with those Vesalian elements and also your computations of longitude on the ground and your survey. So all of that has to work together to figure out whether or not you've got yourself in the zone of totality. So that's why people are concentrated along the edges there. People in the middle have maximal uh, maximal time of totality. And so those people are uh, primarily trying to take uh, photographs and uh, look for look for the intermercurial planet. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of a sense of this, this 1869 eclipse, which was a kind of epic American effort. Uh, this is a, a great photograph you can see there uh, in the black dress, that's Mariah Mitchell uh, at Vassar College who took a bunch of Vassar students to Burlington, Iowa and created quite a sensation in the local newspaper uh, that um, amounted to basically calm down everybody, they're here for the science. That was, that was a sort of a, a message to the young men of Burlington, don't get too excited. Uh, so this, this photograph gives you a sense of the kind of conditions, right? These are temporary observatories that are built in the middle of the zone of totality. You get a sense of the equipment that they've got. There's the dark room uh, on the left. All the, the buildings have removable uh, roofs so you can protect against the elements, but also have, um, have good visibility. Uh, many, many of them who were going to Iowa, which was the, the furthest west in the zone of totality where you could get with the railroad. So that, that was kind of the, the reason that a lot of them stopped um, in Burlington or, or Des Moines, because that's as far as you could go with, um, with the railroad. So it gives you a sense of the conditions. Uh, many of the, the reports, there's a certain kind of East Coast snobbery where they brought a bunch of tools and they brought wood because they thought they were going to be in the absolute middle of nowhere that did not have any kind of amenities. And so when they, they turn up and it's, you know, civilization, they, they are all kind of shocked by this. Anyway, there's many kind of amusing human anecdotes you can you can tell about these these expeditions. But what happens in 1869? Uh, you'll notice this is a this is also a spectroscope. This is a spectroscope of Charles Young. He was at Dartmouth, and was one of the kind of major U.S. spectroscopers who went to many solar eclipses. Uh, but he sort of developed this of his own design, and he used it on the Corona in Burlington, Iowa, and he discovered this. Uh, so you can see this line right there, K1474. And there was a lot of excitement. This happened in 1868. Look, American Triumph, it's worked in 1869. We found a new element, let's call it coronium. Uh, but this, this was a kind of controversial, a kind of controversial, and it was, again, I'm sorry to say, determined in the early, early, 20, uh, early 20th century to be highly ionized iron. So it's not in fact, uh, not in fact a new element, but there was a, a small, a small bit of excitement. Uh, along with the excitement, a bit of disappointment. So this is from Simon Newcomb's diary. So he again was in the center of Saskatchewan getting eaten by mosquitoes under a cloud in 1860. And in 1869, he is sad because he did not find the intermercurial planet. So that was kind of his main task. He was looking for the planet. Now, there's a, there's a very interesting um, development that happens because of this eclipse expedition in uh, 1869. And this is a really kind of surprising thing. It was surprising to me anyway. And it's kind of what got me started doing research on eclipse expeditions because I had been working on circulation and transmission of mathematics and periodical publications. And I was looking at mathematical periodicals in the US in the 19th century. And there was one that's called the Annals of Mathematics, which, sorry, it's called the Analyst. And it is in fact, the predecessor, the original of the Annals of Mathematics, the one that is the kind of preeminent current mathematics journal. And this journal, fascinatingly enough, had its start in Des Moines, Iowa. 
and the editor of this journal was Joel Hendricks. Oops, sorry, there's Joel Hendricks. And Joel Hendricks is not anybody you'd write home about, not anybody that turns up anywhere in the 19th century kind of mathematical practitioner community. He's not on the map. He didn't go to any of the institutions you'd go to. He didn't write any papers. He didn't, didn't do anything. The only thing anybody knows about Joel Hendricks is that he was the editor of what was in fact the most successful mathematics journal in the US in a century. It ran for 10 years, published all kinds of stuff. Uh, then it moved to the University of Virginia, then to um, Harvard and Institute for Advanced Study, which is uh, which is where it is now. So it, it was sort of a sort of a mystery. And I was doing some research on this and you know I found these are not easy to come by. I found some copies of the journal and you can see, I just like to point out that they are um, inconsistent with the typeface, right? So you can see they're not, there's a kind of a idiosyncratic layout to these. And if you think about it, at the time this was happening, these are the population centers over here on the East Coast, institutions, libraries, higher, higher education, et cetera, Des Moines, is like way over there on the far side of my picture in Iowa, right there. And so it's deeply mysterious. How did this guy who didn't go to any of the right any of the right places? Doesn't really have a mathematical education. What is what is his deal? How is he how is he doing this? And the answer to this question came in his bound copy of those journals. So this is at the Des Moines State Historical Society. Uh, in a little box that I don't know if it was ever opened. Uh, and there was his letter of deposit. It was like he handed it to me. Here you go. And in it is his personal correspondence that is very inconveniently bound into the book and therefore hard to open. But in these letters, he's corresponding with Schiaparelli. He's corresponding with um, Trinity College Dublin. He's corresponding with people around the world who are sending contributions to his journal. And it was sort of deeply mysterious until I learned that in 1869, Simon Newcomb, all the East Coast astronomers, everybody came to Des Moines. The mayor of Des Moines held a party for all the visiting scientists. Joel Hendricks, having been a railroad surveyor, made a fortune, had retired to Des Moines, and was a man of status and was therefore invited to the party that the mayor threw for the visiting astronomers. And I don't know this, but presumably they chatted about mathematical publications, which no one had managed to succeed with in the US. They sort of popped up for a year, year and a half, and then they go out of business and complain over work and nobody can edit them and it's all too much work and it's terrible. And Joel Hendricks succeeded. He didn't need the money. His daughter did the typesetting and drew the lithographs, the State Department gave him the paper, and he had a network of East Coast scientists with whom he corresponded, people like Christine Ladd, who looking at the uh, Leoville's journal and Crella had access to those in the libraries in Boston and sent him synopses and sent in articles. And it, so it's this kind of amazing story, a sort of amazing serendipity of what happened because a bunch of scientists went to a particular location. So this is a kind of a nice, kind of a nice and, and sort of unexpected, uh, unexpected antidote. Now, in addition to this kind of contribution to publications of the mathematical community and building a larger network and facilitating uh, training for young mathematicians who would kind of write in to this journal to Hendrix, who sort of served as a clearinghouse because he himself couldn't read, <laughs> couldn't read the papers. He was kind of sending them out to other people to get their views on whether or not to publish and what and so on and so forth. Uh, it also generated a lot of public interest. So there were spread out across the US, right, in 1869, all of these, all of these people, all of these local newspapers are covering the story. All the local newspapers are writing about. That there are all of these kind of diagrams of an eclipse and what's going to happen and directions about how to smoke your glass so you don't break your eyes and 
how to throw an eclipse party. That's just extensive all the way across uh, from coast to coast, even outside of the zone of, total to, of totality. And a result of this is that in combination with the US triumph in 1851, when they kind of beat the British, the disappointment in 1860 and the kind of triumph that happens in 1869, this generates funding, additional funding for something called the US Naval Corps of Professors of Mathematics, um, which is a kind of quirky thing of civilian mathematicians who are hired by the Navy to, to teach and also to do uh, to do research uh, in a kind of a like a research institute context that is totally unprecedented in the U.S. Uh, at this point. So there's a a lot of public interest that generates support for specifically mathematical activity. And so a purse takes <laughs> takes this, of course, as a massive personal triumph, uh, an enormous percentage of the Coast Survey budget, and a corresponding percentage of the Coast Survey reports for 1869 had to do with the total solar eclipse. So it's supposed to be kind of mapping all of the country, but the, the kind of key point of his scientific interest is on uh, the eclipse. And so in 1870, this is the, the path of eclipse totality, and Peirce actually leaves the country the first only time I know of that he ever um, left the country. And he went to Spain uh, in hopes of having additional, you know, kind of additional uh, eclipse uh, triumph. Uh, there's a the map of their uh, their camp for the U.S. Eclipse Expedition again, just to give you an idea of the kind of the scale of these things, uh, the number of people who the num number of people who are there. Now, these expeditions certainly involve. This is true in the U.S. case, the British case, France, Germany, Portugal, uh, all of these various scientific entities that are sending uh, observers out. That there are kind of the men of science, there are all of the assistants, but there also are kind of associated daughters, wives, sisters. Uh, and these women very often were pressed into service. Now, some of them have actual astronomical interests and credentials of their own, uh, and some of, some of them do not. So this is um, a picture of Zena Purse, wife of Charles, daughter-in-law of Benjamin. And she went along on this trip with Benjamin Peirce in 1870. And she didn't have any astronomical training, but she did have a long steamship trip from, they left from the uh, East Coast and they traveled to the UK, to Liverpool. They picked up some British astronomers and they went to Spain. And on this trip, she's basically told, well, we can't give you an instrument. You don't know what you're doing. But what we would like you to do is to sketch the eclipse. And so all the way across the, on the steam trip, uh, the, the steamship, she had a photo of the moon that she pinned to the canopy of her bed and she would time herself. She would give herself two minutes and 20 seconds to try to sketch uh, an accurate representation of the moon. And she did this over and over and over on the five week trip to kind of refine her skills. And she in fact did refine her skills. This is the uh, the image that she produced of the uh, of the eclipse that she observed. These black lines here are Fraunhofer lines, and they um, were a, a, a discovery that that she made. So she was not credited with this originally. It's a kind of classic story. Uh, she showed it to her husband and her father-in-law. Was like, look, look, look! I saw the dark lines. It's the only thing I'm sure of. I saw these dark lines, and they said, "We, no, we don't think you really did." And then there was a photographer, an amateur British photographer, who had a image of the three, also the three dark lines, and they said, "Oh, okay, maybe, maybe it's something." Um, so this is just kind of one anecdote, but there are many women who are uh, involved in these expeditions doing uh, interesting things. Now, I'm just going to mention, that's my time. Yeah. I'm just going to mention a couple more of these uh, that will bring us to a sort of larger, uh, a kind of larger point. So this is an eclipse in 1871. So this again, right, 68, 69, 70, 71. Uh, this is, again, across uh, the Indian subcontinent. And this is a kind of interesting story because um, Regan is Achari, who's on the left there, who was at the uh, Madras Observatory. He was a local child who'd worked at the observatory and built his way up and got some training. And 
um, became the first f uh, Indian member of the Royal Astronomical Society based on his observations in the 1871 eclipse. Now he also produced this really beautiful and magnificent um, summary, I'll say, of the transits of Venus. So this is produced in six Indian languages and it is a document that kind of merges um, sort of British observational practices with traditional Indian astronomy. And it's, I unfortunately don't read any of those six Indian languages. And so uh, that's all I can tell you about it, but it is a, it is a kind of remarkable, a remarkable document um, that speaks to the kind of interaction of, of colonial and, and local science. So there's a kind of a lot of interesting things that are being explored by colleagues in India and also New Zealand related to um, this, this kind of blending of, of astronomy. Now, this paper here uh, was some work done with two students, uh, Meg Friars there, and this is Mixie. So Meg is a historian of science and Mixie is a chemist um, who did a lot of work on uh, the spectroscopy of the, the 1871 eclipse. Uh, and Meg is currently working on the women in British and American fieldwork. So this is a, a kind of a current and a booming area of study. She's not the only one working on uh, women in field work. So there are uh, obviously various kinds of uh, field work and other kinds of sciences, but eclipse expeditions are a really kind of interesting case study for uh, women doing mathematics um, and astronomy. Now, one other uh, example that I want to give in this sort of late 19th, uh, late 19th century period uh, is this eclipse. So this was in 1898, uh, sorry, 1889, I always get it backwards, 1889. And you can see that this cuts just across um, Trinidad. And I had a student who's from Trinidad and was doing a research project with me and found out there was an eclipse through Trinidad and wanted to do some work on it. Uh, and this resulted in a really nice paper about the local community that was supporting these observers, right? So there's a very complex relationship between these expeditions from colonial powers that are going to places that they have colonized or have military occupation and the way that that facilitates every aspect of the travel and the accommodations and the fact that they can um that they can actually do um, sort of do their science uh, and there's a woman that turns up in this story uh, elizabeth brown who's a really interesting i won't say more about her, but she's she's a sort of really interesting anomalous case of a a woman who went on one of the or went on three of these expeditions, but she organized her own self and paid for her own self and went with a cousin um, because it wouldn't be proper uh, for her for not to. So she went with a cousin and a priest um, and went on uh, to well two. She planned the third one, but she died before um, before she went on the third of uh, the third expedition. Now, all through this period of time, so this is up to 1889, and then a couple more in the, the early uh, the early 1900s, there were sort of terrible, <laughs> terrible record with clouds. So 1911, 1913, 1915, everybody got shut out everywhere. But the kind of most famous date, if I asked anybody if they know anything about eclipse observations, they would probably tell me about 1919. And 1919, of course, is the date where this paper, again, attributed to Eddington, months and months and months and months of work by a lot of people measuring eclipse plates uh, and looking at uh, looking at images to confirm Einstein's general theory of relativity. So all this time from the discovery of Neptune in 1846 and the initial suggestion that maybe another planet exists that explains the precession of the perihelion of Mercury, there is an effort to locate that planet there's an effort to correct the orbital computations of Mercury, and they can only account for about 50% of the precession using all the precision, all the fixes they can come up with. And so it's not until 1919, Einstein's theory turns out to explain everything. And the observations confirm the theory, and the situation is that Mercury is close enough to the sun that the space-time warp is what generates the procession. And so again, it's a kind of mathematical innovation 
that changes the astronomical practice and answers the question about, about planetary motion. Now, the it does it would be easy to think that that was the end of that, right? The eclipse observation, they figured they are not going to find the intermercurial planet, Einstein's theory of general relativity. But what happens then is that this becomes the task for eclipse observation uh, for eclipse observers from various places. So in 1922, there's a team of people who think, okay, well, sure. They think they verified Einstein's theory and Eddington, you know, supervised all of this work, but really might be wrong. We should check again. And so in 1919, uh, 1922, they check again. And then this becomes the question that people who are going to observe an eclipse who maybe don't have their own research question that they decide to check. So much like let's look for an intramercurial planet, it now becomes, let's see if we can verify Einstein's theory with our own observations. And there's a, a sort of, uh, well, there's a, in 1841, uh, there is a, a path of totality that's going across uh, central China. Um, this is maybe a better picture for us. Uh, and this is, again, some work with a student, who, Yansong Li, who did all the, the language work for this. And there's there's this eclipse that's coming up 1841 and 1836. There's an eclipse that's going across uh, Russia and Japan. And there's a plan to use that for practice. So again, the Chinese scientists think home court advantage, we really have to nail it if the eclipse is coming to China. So they go practice in 1831, but the, 1836, but there are clouds. And so, and so they don't um, they don't see anything. And then by 1941, of course, wartime conditions in China are extreme. So scientists from Japan, from Russia, who were going to come, cancel. Everybody cancels. Uh, and the so it is left only to these Chinese, Chinese scientists to do the observations. So there's a, a beautiful quotation from Professor Yuzei, who's the um, considered the founder of modern Chinese astronomy. He was trained at Yerkes Observatory in Chicago, went back to China right before this eclipse. Um, and he, there's a, it's just a great description that he's giving about how other countries observe eclipses. And he says, we're in the most difficult period of nationwide resistance against the Japanese invasion. We are grateful for the opportunity to study the eclipse under even under such circumstances. The government and the Central Academy of Sciences, they also got a huge range of uh, industrial support from, again, railroads, from uh, manufacturing firms, et cetera, have shown great importance and provided full assistance and convenience regarding the observation, including funding and transportation. Given the current state of the war, foreign astronomers were unable to come. Therefore, the responsibility for this eclipse falls only on us. And so it was it was taken very seriously, right? We're the only ones who can be here. If any science is going to happen in this 1941 eclipse, it has to be done by us. And, and then there's a kind of an amazing, uh, it seems a little defensive to me, but I think it's also just wanting people to know that an eclipse obscured by clouds is not unusual. So we have these big observations, but maybe we might get shut out. And then there's a nice discussion where he explains that even the likes of Cambridge astronomer Professor Stratton has undertaken distant expeditions and taken a lot of instruments to observe only to be foiled by persistent rain on six out of seven occasions. Uh, however, many of the public are unaware of this, but we've already started cultivating our endeavor and we must reap the rewards. Right? So there's a lot of um, sort of narrative spin on this, I'll say. Right? You want to do the science, it's very expensive, you need a lot of support, but you need the people giving you the support to realize that it's high stakes, but it might, it might come to nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, lest, lest you think this is an entirely 19th century story, uh, I'll assure you that this is still going on, that there are eclipse observations that are being made to confirm mathematical results. So this is a paper by a colleague of mine, 
about um, sort of a computation of the corona compared with um, the images that are generated. Uh, this is the 2017 eclipse, and they have, uh, of course, new oh, plans and research, new plans and research connections afoot for the one in 20, uh, 2024, 2026, 27, and 28. So we have a, there's a kind of a run of four that are coming up now uh, in various places, uh, various places around the world. So this is still a very much an active area where the fusion of kind of national scientific interests, uh, mathematical prediction, right? New mathematical um, tools and techniques aided by computational, right? Increasingly com increasing computational power, refined technology, more sophisticated imaging, practices uh, and the kind of confluence of all of those things, uh, including with uh, national scientific interests and the challenges of funding. So all of the sort of features of 19th century eclipse expeditions uh, still uh, still appear. Uh, so we've got a, a website uh, at St. Andrews. This was a, a project done by these students here on the bottom about the history and science of total eclipse to uh, total solar eclipses. So if you want any more information about some of these things or uh, other countries or things I did not discuss, that is a, a great place to look. Um, and also just to let you know, this is um, sort of an active area of current research. So I've got um, a workshop that will be happening in November of next year at ICMS in Edinburgh. We have a kind of global network of scholars who will come together who work on history of mathematics uh, history of astronomy. We've got a couple of um, mathematical astronomers and a couple of astronomers who are coming. Um, some, uh, yeah, so there, it'll be a kind of a big, a big gathering of people coming from different disciplinary perspectives to sort of uh, unpack um, eclipse observation expeditions and the process of all the process of what goes into that as part of our, our kind of shared uh, human heritage of of mathematics. So this is happening um, next November. So just to let you know if that's of interest to anyone. And uh, just in the end, some special thanks to the sort of funding from these uh, uh, these societies. And also just a, a note here, this is um, a photo taken by Jay Paskoff, who was a sort of Mr. Solar Eclipse. He's been to 85 eclipses in the course of his career. Uh, a huge promoter of, of science and um, sort of personally a great a great support and encourager of this work uh, very early on. Uh, he passed away uh, last year. So I just um, use his photo there as a, an appreciation. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. So before beginning, uh, I'll stay here, please. Before beginning, there is a very important question. Who is coming to dinner this night? Because I have to reserve the restaurant. Uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque, sei, sette, otto, nove, dieci, undici, dodici. I think Five. I was first. Maybe. It's a Because I reserve for 15, so I need 15. Well, repeat. Uno, uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque, sei, sette, otto. No, the 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, perfect. And so now, now, Gemma, you don't come? Okay. Sorry. Now that the screen says, well, and I've been left. Okay, so uh, Gisela, you want to speak? Yeah, go. Um, it's all about the instruments. Yes. You were talking about some new things that are coming. Yes. Uh, but, um, my question is, do they keep using ancient instruments, like club sets and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, they're definitely using, yes, it's all the combination things. Yeah, they're using astrolabes. Um, they definitely use sextants. Yes, it's, it's kind of all hands on deck. And they it just kind of keeps building. And then there also are some, um, a lot of recycling that happens. So if you take a spectroscope on this, trip and then you realize oh that didn't quite work you bring it back and you change out the lens and you retrofit it or you take some parts that are kind of in your cabinet and fit it so at Dartmouth um in the physics department at Dartmouth there's a kind of a closet downstairs that's been there since probably 1850 and that's where the Charles Young spectroscope just lives on a shelf it's not it's just down there and they have all kinds of bits and pieces so there are just boxes of 
you know, whatever kind of extenders or lenses or mounts or all, all kinds of things. And so you really get the sense. It sort of feels like a makerspace, right? You get the sense that these astronomers would think, okay, we're going to go there. We're going to do this. Let me rummage around and see what I can, just see what I can make. So there's a, there's a real kind of spirit of experimentation. So I didn't really show you um, some of the, <laughs> some of the failed efforts, um, but in the Burlington group, they were, they tied a, uh, maybe it was a telescope. They tied, a, I think, a telescope onto the back of a chair with a sock because their their mount broke in transportation. So there are all of these kind of incredible stories about um, in the the 1941. They had a special camera that was shipped into Hong Kong, uh, but it got bombed, so it just sort of blew up. And then they, you know, had to improvise with whatever other cameras that they had around. And these are it's kind of perpetual. Um, there was a Jay, Jay, Jay's family, actually, they talk about eclipse errands. So he would be at some far flung corner of the world watching an eclipse or, you know, going on an eclipse expedition. And he would phone his wife and say, oh, our, you know, Z2583 lens just had a crack in it. So here's my credit card number. Call this guy, the head of the lens company, give him my credit card number, tell him to fly first class to Indonesia and bring me a new lens. And so this, it, it just, it's part of the, part of the deal, right? Then as the, then as now, uh, but they are, they're using, you know, the full spectrum of instruments. Okay, the spherical work, sorry, but then because it goes in the same direction. Um, I see that in the website, you have this section on culture and folklore. So the connection with the older question is this, is how in methodologically speaking in your research, how do you, uh, deal with all the uh, culture surrounding astrological knowledge yeah. related with the use yeah. of these instruments. And so, so like, the question is how, what are your methodological guidelines to make the separation? Yeah, this is, um, this is a question. This is a good question. Um, and it's a question I am essentially only running, just running into. So I mostly, my own work, I mean, my PhD was on Benjamin Purse. So I mostly worked in the US context where there's not a lot of astrological context for these things. Um, and so now that I'm sort of looking, looking in other places. So this is something that will be a topic of discussion at the workshop next um, next November. And it's, um, you know, I would I would say it's a, there's sort of layers of research you can do, right? There's the kind of scientific questions. There's the questions about the instruments and the context for all of that. And then there's the sort of etiological context of the, you know, where the questions are coming from and what the kind of what the approach is. So I myself feel partly limited in this because of my languages. So if, you know, I think if you really want to kind of really want to understand that, but I do have some, a bunch of, well, several colleagues um, who work on Indian, um, Indian astronomy, um, it's a massive field with a massive, <laughs> with a massive literature, and and those questions are, you know, kind of dealt with. But it's yes, yeah, 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 because their astrology is different. And then, yeah, so it is it is complicated, and I think it's especially complicated if you want to avoid the kind of colonial lens, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so so that's really it's it's tricky. So in the eighteen seventy one eclipse paper paper. Um, we did use some sources that have the sort of local accounts, right? They're, they're, again, they're in translation, but they're sort of the local accounts about Rahu is, you know, eating the sun. And so they have like fires that they're burning to um, get rid of the evil spirits, but fires and eclipse observations, are not, it's not so the astronomers get mad and, you know, there are these sort of cultural tensions that occur. And so... I would say that's kind of my point of entry tends to be the the kind of points of cultural tension, but not a not a comprehensive answer. Yes. So my first comment is for Marco. The computer is running out of battery, so please. Oh my God! Again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So it was not a question. No, no, it's just a comment. <laughs> but a comment. No, uh, the first question is, what were those lines that this lady saw in the space? Okay. And the second question is, around this time, it was written the, from the Earth to the Moon, right? Yes. Uh, so my question is, 
whether these expeditions inspired other pieces of literature. So, yeah, <laughs> yes. So there are, I would say particularly in the last maybe 25 years of the 19th century, maybe just the 1900s, is a huge period of travel literature anyway, mm -hmm. right? The sort of yes. Victorian ladies abroad kind of thing, right? And so this certainly happened in the case of eclipses. So Elizabeth Brown writes two novels, um, well, novels. They're, <laughs> they're kind of fictionalized accounts of her own personal experience um, called Cotton. The one is Caught in the Tropics and the other one, the title escapes me, but there's a there's kind of second one um, that she also writes. So there are, you know, kind of short stories and magazines, that kind of thing. Um, the It doesn't generate the kind of literature that gets generated about life on Mars. I mean, that's a much bigger, that has a much bigger influence on, on literature than, than eclipse expeditions. I, in what I've seen, it's mostly kind of newspaper accounts and short form, you know, kind of periodicals, that kind of thing with these kind of snazzy graphics that seems, seems to be the, the direction that it goes. And then, uh, you know, sort of reports afterwards about the most amazing photograph and the this but I don't um there's a, the yeah I don't know of a, like a sort of upsurge in fiction uh beyond what's kind of written by the like the actual expeditioners so the the guys that wound up in the central Saskatchewan in the mud they're kind of two published accounts of that they're I mean, they're not they're not great <laughs> like if you want to read a really dry poorly written story about a terrible trip uh, you can read those um but that's kind of the that's that's about what gets produced from a literary perspective that, that I'm aware of and the, the lines that oh they're, they're called Fraunhofer lines um do I remember um It has to do. It's um. I can I can send I can send you a link. But it's something about the something about the refraction, and the, that they kind of turn up there. And they only they don't always turn up. They only turn up sometimes because of. They're not up there. No, they're not up there. No, yeah, they're not there. There, but there are like this is a much more. You can see. Oh, it's not fine enough. But you you it, like if you look at mine, there are some kind of dark darker mm -hmm. rays that come out like like kind of like this mm -hmm. um and so sometimes they're more prominent than other times but uh, this very second i can't remember quite the chemistry of that yes there's a question from alan mandel Ali. Oh. Yeah, hi, thank you. That was that was fun. Uh yeah, my this is irrelevant to this, but my mother was on an eclipse expedition in Mauritania in the early 70s. Mm. And some wild stories about it, but uh but my 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 can you hear me? Can you hear me? If I mute Go. Okay. Go. Yeah. Anyway, I was just I was reminiscing about my mother's stories about her, the eclipse expedition she did to Mauritania in the 70s. But anyway, uh, my understanding is that by the 1880s, people were no longer looking for uh, an intermercurial planet, but were thinking in terms of. Uh, planetoids or or small bodies that were causing that might be causing a refraction and that that was the focus of research at the in the last decade of, of the 19th century and that people like Zelliger and even Newcomb were giving up on the law of gravity uh at that <laughs> Uh, obviously, it didn't have anything so sophisticated as 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 general relativity, but they were thinking in terms of uh, uh, localized failures of the law of gravity. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that okay. does that tie into the these? I mean, how does that? It obviously does, but how does that tie into these 
uh, eclipse expeditions. Right. So, so that's it's true that it's not sort of uniformly maintained over the last chunk of the 19th century that everybody's looking for the intermercurial planet. Um, these expeditions are, I mean, they're, they're, you can just be an individual person going on an expedition, right? Or you can go with the British Navy, right? There, there's lots of different kinds of ways that people interact with an eclipse expedition. And so not everybody has the same set of questions or the same set of ideas about what's going on. In 1878, I didn't talk about this one, but there's a, an eclipse a trajectory across the, the Rocky Mountains in the U.S. There's a beautiful book about this written by David Barron called American Eclipse. Um, and James Watson goes, and he is sure that he found an intermercurial planet. This is in 1878. And he's got a photograph, and it's like a source of big, it's a source of big discussion. And so in the kind of aftermath of that for the next I would say it's kind of 10 or 15 years, the debate, that debate about whether or not that photograph of James Watson is really Vulcan is what they call the intermercurial planet is real or not is kind of ongoing. And in, in conjunction with that, and this really picks up in the 1880s is a big debate about the utility I'll say of photography as a scientific tool. So is that image trustworthy? Is it true? Is it like useful in some kind of way? What does it mean? How does it like, do we take what we saw with our eye over what we captured with a camera, right? How do those things relate to one another kind of philosophically, kind of practically, methodologically? So this is a big debate that's happening um, in the 1880s and the 1890s. So there certainly are people, like you say, like um, Simon Newcomb is, is one of them, who think, oh, we've just got it wrong. This there, you know, it's not it's not there. We shouldn't be looking for an intermercurial planet. Uh, and equally, there are people who are still, you know, sort of carrying out carrying out the search. So it does, um, yeah, the sort of eighteen nineties, and I would say kind of eighteen ninety to nineteen ten ish. It's kind of um, a bit. It's a bit murky. So there was a plan in the nineteen. 15 eclipse certainly i think and also 1913 uh, they had a plan very similar to what succeeded in 1919 so even before um, einstein had published um his work it had been kind of discussed and I, i'm not totally sure how they sort of got access to it but um there was a plan to try uh, several years before and uh, before before it actually worked so i think you're right that in the kind of latter part of the period I'm talking about, the kind of consensus disintegrates quite a bit about, about this intermercurial planet. Right, but what I was also asking about was that there was an alternative theory, as I understand it. I mean, I'm going back in my memory of these things, which is- Yeah, yeah, there is, yeah, there's an alternative there's theory. theory I don't... of planetoids, uh, of, of, uh, of, of small bodies, that should be causing a kind of refraction that would be typical that you would expect, not from one body, but from uh, thousands of bodies. From multiples. Yes. I mean, that is certainly one of the ideas that's floating around. And are they trying to, are there, ex, I mean, I gather that was Newcomb's. Oh, are there efforts to find them? Oh, sure. I mean, Newcomb yeah. is a bit yeah. guy, so I mean, uh, in the story. So, uh I assume that Newcomb was trying to measure those sorts of things. Yes, 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 yes. There's there are many efforts, many efforts to find right anything or set of things that might be might be causing this disruption. Yes. Is that, I think. Thank you, Ken. Oh, Kat, Katty had a question. Ken, okay. I don't know. Yeah. So thank you very much for illuminating this so, mm -hmm. I'm interested in how the, the expedition work, the finance, and um, above all, uh, who are the people uh, uh, who joined the, the expedition? For example, so, uh, I'm particularly interested in the Franz Dina in 1874. Yeah. Well, uh, there were several expeditions uh, uh, who came to Japan. And in Japan, uh, to today there are uh, some monuments yeah. uh, that commemorate the success of the, of the wish. Yeah. But then Japan uh, 
that had been a civil war in 1868. For example, my my native town was burnt down completely that the war. Yeah. Um, and then that, that was six years later. But of course, the, at least two years uh, before, the map had begun the preparations. Then only three or four years after the, uh, after the Civil War, and uh, that, that marked the end of the, the reign of the Fuga family, the new government began. But then they decided to uh, visit Japan for scientific observation. Mm -hmm. Then who was under the expedition? Uh, consisted of the educated people. But who were those people that, uh, that educated about the requests <laughs> as to visit the, such a country? Yeah. So it depends a lot on what context you're talking about, about mm. who goes and, and why. So in the British context, there is the British Navy and there is the, the Royal Astronomical Society who is mm -hmm. sending official i mean they have something called the solar eclipse planning committee mm -hmm. that plans for years out and they get money they get some money from the government they get some money from the royal society um in all in these cases they have the like the british navy at their disposal essentially so the navy just takes you where you want to go um, so they don't have transportation costs in mm -hmm. uh, in the kind of uk sense um that said also in the uk there's um the Liverpool Astronomical Society and the British Association for the Advancement of Science, which are um, amateur societies, and they will sort of organize their own, like Elizabeth Brown was like self-funded. She just wanted to go and she had means and she just went. Um, and there was a long sort of on a separate, well, kind of parallel to her, there was a Royal Astronomical Society trip that went. Um, and there were... I think there were four astronomers that went. So it was, a, and then there was Elizabeth Brown and her cousin and the priest, and so they're going to to turn it out. And they have, um, you know, she has connections there with the local governor's wife and the, you know, so they kind of get put up in places and ferried around and wined and dined. And so in the kind of British context, that tends to be how it goes when they turn up in India. There's the British infrastructure <laughs> that exists and that that kind of facilitates it all. Um, in the, the US context, it's a much more kind of ragtag operation, especially at the beginning. And so James Gillis kind of volunteered. Um, he had been on a boat in 1855, I think, um, a boat that was in the Mediterranean maybe, and he uh, saw an eclipse and he was therefore quite personally interested. And so he requested leave and he requested passage on a ship and he requested instruments all his own of his own volition um simon newcomb kind of personally generated that trip the ones that went to Elizabeth island you know petitioned the coast survey to borrow a boat and they said okay you can have this old one that doesn't really work and so there was a you know it was a kind of a patch together job in the case of the the u.s expeditions and you know even in in 1869, there are private individuals who are going, there are universities and colleges who are sending, you know, astronomers or astronomy students or uh, Mariah Mitchell got funding from Vassar to take eight students. They stayed with, you know, they're all kind of camped out of the house of a friend of one of the girls that, you know, so there's, there's a lot of that kind of thing that happens um, in the U.S. context. And um, the Chinese, in the Chinese case, um, they they got so they got funding from the government which was i think on the order it was sort of like 800 not dollars but it was sort of 800 money units i forget what they're called and then the actual expenses were about 150 times that and and it's not clear exactly where that money came from or if it was produced at any point or if they just sort of ran up a bunch of debt i don't i don't know exactly what happened with that um but that was um a group of astronomers most of whom had had some training in the u.s on the indemnity boxer indemnity scholarships and then come back and they were directors of various observatories who they, they weren't kind of centrally tasked. I think they 
found it important and then they kind of self-organized. They got a bunch of government funding. They got a bunch of funding from uh, corporations. There's a, there's a really incredible amount of kind of industrial corporate support, both through providing trucks and railway carriage and, you know, all that kind of stuff and also from, from money. And so the, the scientific instruments are always uh, hugely, hugely expensive. Um, sometimes they get borrowed from, from various places. So when, um, I just, uh, George Davison was observing in Alaska, he, he wanted to take 35 chronometers because chronometers are very unreliable. And so you want to have a lot of them so you can think you have the right time. Um, but they're very, you, you probably know what a chronometer looks like, but they're not watertight. And he had to go the last hundred miles in an open canoe. And so he decided, oh, I better not take all the chronometers. So he only took nine of them, but he had to sort of borrow them from coast survey offices around and friends and neighbors and a science museum. And, you know, there, there's this massive effort of collecting your gear before you're, before you're ready to go. I mean, it's, it's years. These, it takes years to kind of organize these things. Um, and the, the funding is kind of sort of catch as, as catch can. Um, in the case of Germany, that's much, that's very centrally organized, right? Kind of German empire is more similar to the British case. And I would say in Portugal, um, again, it's a similar thing, right? They have fleets going out to their colonies and you just hop on one of those boats with your, with your telescope and you're more or less in business. Uh, but yeah, it, it varies a lot. Um, thank you. So at the beginning of your talk, you talked a little bit about um, the U.S. mathematical community mm. and the U.K. mathematical mm. community mm. and the kind of need of the U.S. mathematical community to mm. catch itself mm -hmm. from the U.K. mathematical community. So I was wondering if you can um, just say something about like um, what, why? Um, mm. The mm. the mathematical community in the U.S. felt the need to to reunite, you know, to detach from from UK mathematics. And yeah. to what extent was, if at all, it motivated in some sort of expedition? Oh, hugely, yeah. hugely motivated. Oh, yeah. Which is, yeah. Um. Yeah. So, in the um, sort of the, I would say, kind of eighteen twenty five to eighteen forty five. Let's say. Um, there's a group of um, American scientists, so Louis Agassiz and Benjamin Abther Gould and Benjamin Peirce is one of them, and um, Joseph Henry, and they together have a, a group that they call the Scientific Lazzaroni, and there's kind of the older ones and there's the younger ones, and they, I think it's a combination of kind of national pride, right? We want... Um, specialized publications. We want higher education to be developed in science, all kinds of sciences. Peirce Benjamin Peirce happens to be the mathematician amongst them, but you know, Joseph Henry is a natural philosopher and Agassiz is a zoologist. Um, and they want to put American science on the map as a means of asserting like, scientific independence, much like the asser assertion of like national national independence right so that's i think it's a function of them being kind of strong personalities who are headstrong who have patriotic and scientific motivations to want to make this happen they also want their own they want government funding to do basic science so this is a this is a piece of it mm -hmm. and there's a kind of amazing story of um what's his name hassler ferdinand hassler who comes he's the first superintendent of the coast survey and he goes to Europe for like a couple of years and he susses out all these super fancy, expensive state of the art scientific instruments and he buys them all and he comes back to the U S and he runs a kind of graduate seminar. And this is all under the auspices of the coast survey. So he's like under the commerce clause and he's supposed to be producing maps. He's the great grandson of Benjamin Franklin. So he's probably like has some political savvy because he extracts money from Congress, huge amounts of money, for 10 years doesn't produce a single map. <laughs> and, so, and so he's, you know, he's using all this money to do kind of basic science. And that's part of what they want, right? They kind of look at Europe and they say, 
well, there's Leoville's journal, there's Crella. We don't have anything like that in America. We need to be having our own mathematical journals. You can't, if, you know, all of these people are going to Europe to study. Why don't we have them stay in America and study? So this is sort of their, their kind of program. They're on the founding board of the Smithsonian. They're active in kind of government policy to secure funding for scientific research. They're on the the kind of start the the ground floor of the Lawrence Scientific School and the Sheffield School at Yale. Mm -hmm. So they want to elevate the status of American science. And that's kind of the mission. And and why then? Like what is there any specific event that kind of like um motivated those people in this specific time to, you know, seek for this independence? Um that is a good question. I not there's not a kind of sort of specific incident that I'm not a specific incident that I'm that I'm aware of. Um, part of it, I mean, in the case of mathematics, part of it I think is Peirce's own, and he is a very strong character, <laughs> strong character. And I think some of it was just his own personal the thing he wanted to do. Uh, in 1842, he was the editor of a math journal, the Cambridge Miscellany of Mathematics, and he wanted it to be a research journal. And it was way over the head of everybody. And it, you know, kind of like failed in a year. There were four issues of it. But throughout that journal, he and Joseph Lovering, who was a physics professor at Harvard, they write kind of a series of manifestos about American science. And they're all of these kind of, well, like over the top descriptions of astronomers who are up all night observing the sky to bring us kind of national glory. And if they're up all night, you know, we must sustain them. And, you know, we need to pay George Bond, the observer at Harvard. And um, if if there's a chance for American science, he, they're, they're pretty clear. They say it's going to happen in astronomy or sound or light because they, they think, well, we're not going to compete with Felix Klein. We're, you know, we're not going to be that. So we have to do something we can do. And America has big, dark skies. We have very fast computers. Like, I mean, like human computers, Sears Cook Walker at the Naval Observatory was kind of legendarily fast at computing orbits and things like that. And so we've got like big dark skies, we've got telescopes, we've got computers, this is our chance. And so that's in 1842. Mm-hmm. And so when Neptune's discovered in 46, um, he is all over it. So there's the kind of controversy between Leverrier and, and Adams. And a lot of that's playing out in the newspaper. And Purse sort of chimes in about something that's called the happy accident hypothesis, uh, which is to say it's it's an accident that you found it because your computations don't actually don't actually predict the thing that you found. Right? And the kind of details of <laughs> the details of this are very murky, but the the kind of best answer I can say for what's going on is that it's the difference between like a local and a global solution to some differential equations. And so what he's saying is, well, you computed this orbit, but the real one is this one, but they happen to align during this period when you found it. So anyway, he's he kind of um, spews in the newspaper about this being a happy accident. And then various European scientists report like, well, other people would be well advised to have such a happy accident. You know, there's, there's a lot of kind of back and forth. He doesn't make any friends mm-hmm. um, in Europe, but he wants the national credit for having computed the orbit, right? We didn't find the planet, but we did compute the orbit. And we computed the orbit using only American observations. So the day that the news about Neptune arrived in Boston on the steamship, that night they're at Harvard Observatory making observations so they can calculate the orbit. Um, And so, yeah, the question of motivation is a little bit I mean, I don't think I have any convincing answer to that, but there's definitely, there's definitely a competitive, you know, there's definitely a competitive spirit, which some of which I think is personal mm-hmm. and some of which is a, a kind of a national, national interest. Yeah. Question about your methodology for the use of eclipse maps in your own work. Are you, yes. because I mean, <clears throat> geographically. Yes. Your work is expanding. Matter. And so yeah. are you looking at has the totality and saying, oh, here's the place, like to what extent is it, are you using the predictive house of totality to generate where to look for accounts? Yeah. So yes. <laughs> so 
it is, I mean, you can go on the NASA website. So there are a couple of websites where you can, you can find these things. You can go on the NASA website and for the past 10, 100 years, I think they go back 500 years and they go forward. By, I mean, they're vast calculations of these things. Um, I look at them, I look at them a lot because exactly what you say, but also in terms of like, kind of where they're happening, when, and how that corresponds to kind of global politics is also really interesting. Um, it's very helpful. So I've had several summer students funded by the Royal Astronomical Society to do work on some of these things. Um, and those students often have personal interests because of geography, and um, they have language skills, they have, you know, et cetera. So that's part of the part of the drivers so they'll sometimes you know we'll look at the maps and they'll say oh yeah that looks you know like that's a place I know about let's do that um and so I yeah it's maybe a little bit haphazard like it's it it's at a point now where it needs to be there you know there needs to be a little more formal structure I think but um yeah I, I find them really useful and the 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 kind of logistics of making them is surprisingly complicated so they're you know like I said there's kind of two guys that that do it that's their that's their kind of main thing and basically everybody the, just defer defers to them um which is pretty yeah pretty amazing yes so how good for people in, before this period calculating the uh, predicting the eclipses I'm asking because there's this story that I read about the con Conquistadors arriving to America and threatening the population, and then using an eclipse as a means to you know, yeah make their point or assert yeah. some power. Yeah, and is this possible? It's po <laughs> it's possible. I mean, those those stories circulate. They yes. exist. Um, the kind of sort of specific unpacking of the veracity of any single one of those requires, you know, kind of cultural. Sort of cultural sensitivity and methodology and you have to look at the techniques of eclipse reckoning at the time and in that context so there are many 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 methods of eclipse reckoning that people use so it's very important in indian context because of its religious connotation so there are particular times of an eclipse phase when you're supposed to propitiate your ancestors in various ways so there's a kind of a five hour religious ceremony that you're meant to inter like engage in during during eclipse so the there certainly are methods of calculating eclipses. How accurate those are is kind of one question. And how well people correlate the prediction with the location mm -hmm. also hugely varies. So there's a case in 18... Uh, no, it's, not, it's like 1786 or something in the U.S. where they, you know, they were sure they had it and they missed it, like literally by a mile. So it was, you know, they were just kind of in the, in the wrong spot. And so that does happen. That does happen a lot. So it's yes. I can less consistent. If you're in one place and you observe the sky, maybe you can come up with some periodicity. Yeah, yeah. But some people from Spain predict this. Yeah. Eclipse in Mexico. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, and what's since, the year for that? But it was about the increase of the time, so yeah. it's the 15th century. Yeah, it's, yeah, so depending kind of who was doing, I mean, there's different methods about, and mm -hmm. I mean, they maybe they got lucky, or maybe it, maybe yes. it, maybe it worked. It's hard, yeah, it's hard to say. A happy accident. A happy accident. Yes. <laughs> that's a happy for the indigenous Not so happy, yeah. But there are, I mean, there are often, there are stories like this, oh, over, yes, you yes. know, over time where some, you know, there's some sort of eclipse and then, you know, there's a, a claim of something. There's also, um, with the sort of, I showed the Alaska maps and the, there was a, a conference for the 150th anniversary in 2019 of that 1869 map. And I went to the conference. It was an extraordinary experience in many ways. It was at a kind of the Kwanlun Dun Cultural Center, and it was convened by the elders of the, the Kwanlun Dun, and it was um, a, a, just an amazing melange of elder storytelling and indigenous language place name talks and a couple, you know, kind of scientific talks. 
And <laughs> right before I spoke, this woman um, got up and read a poem in the lay like, kind of clicks and pops, the sort of indigenous language. And then there was a, a translation and it was a poem written by her grandfather, grandfather, um, who had observed the 1869 eclipse. <laughs> and the the sort of legend, the, the sort of story was that if you saw an eclipse, you would turn into a rock. So this is the kind of cultural narrative on eclipses. You want to avoid them because if you see an eclipse, you'll turn into a rock. And the poem from her grandfather was, um, I'm going to climb up high on the mountain and watch the eclipse. So I'll be a rock everyone can see. And I was like, oh, it's a tent back to follow. <laughs> but um, but, um, but anyway, so there there are um, you know these these kind of explanations that that many cultures have for for an eclipse. Um, and there also are instances where indigenous populations are, you know, it kind of an eclipse is concurrent with the arrival of settler populations, and so they believe that to be some kind of omen of some kind. Yeah. So there's many. Yeah, many more stories than I could possibly <laughs> explain. Hey, do we still have time? Do I have time? I don't know what the... we'll, 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 we'll. Um, I'm wondering, so you, most of the talk was about the 19th century, mid 19th century, mm -hmm. and then early 20th century. Mm -hmm. So it was about discovering Lockton and then yes. confirming um, Einstein's yep. theory. Yep. But it keeps going until 2012, I think was the last. Naively, I would think, why are we still? What role does it still play? We have satellites and so on. What are we still? So what are we still learning nowadays? Yeah. So what are we still learning? So there's a couple of things that um, oops, I'll show you this. Um, there's a couple of things. So this um is about checking your models with observation. So this is written by um. They're mathematical solar physicists or mathematical solar theorists. They might as well be physicists. But um, so they've got predicted um, this, this, these are predictions, right? And then there's photographs. And so they're checking their models about how the corona works. So the coronal heating problem is kind of the major current question in solar, uh, kind of solar theory about why there's such a big difference that's not totally explained by density. And so 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 kind of understanding the solar corona and the kind of models of that is hoped will shed insight or you know offer insight into the to solar corona so there is also current work going on there's something nasa is doing called punch which stands for some kind of acronym <laughs> but what well, what they're doing is they're collecting data images so it's just images it's like vast quantities of data and there are various solar theorists who are trying to um, sort of join the models for the heliosphere and the model for the corona. So there's kind of two different models that function very differently, but there's a kind of boundary layer. So it's a kind of a boundary layer problem that's um, kind of data that gets collected. Then people will kind of make these models of the corona and you can check how well your model's working if you have photographic images from a corona, from a from an eclipse. So that's um, it's kind of one thing that people are investigating. Um, there's work being done on um, solar flares, which is also related to this. That I know less about that, but that's also um, has to do with um, this set of questions. There are some sort of innovations in imaging technology that get tested in, in solar eclipses. And there's work that gets, you know, you sort of, get time on a plane. So there are Air Force planes that fly in the path of eclipse totality and you can get 12 minutes if you if you follow if you follow the path. Um, and that 1941, I didn't say this part, but in 1941, that Chinese eclipse expedition, they actually got, this is extraordinary, two planes from the Navy at a time the numbers I have is that the Chinese military only had 65 planes in wartime and they designated two to the to the eclipse. And one of them had a, a kind of young pilot who just kind of got nabbed off the street. And they said, oh, go see if you can get a picture of the eclipse from a plane. And so he strapped a camera into the machine gun holster and um, took, some, took, some pictures of the, took some pictures of the sun. And then it was like the first international radio broadcast of China 
was the the subject of that was the the total solar eclipse. So there, I, there, I mean, that's 1941, but there still continue to be sort of technological innovations that get kind of tested um, with a with an eclipse because because again the the kind of atmospheric conditions like you know the atmospheric conditions are very complicated and the the light um, the contrast the contrast is high and you want well like you want precision you want precision like that um, so those are those are some of the questions that people are still asking. Thank you.